Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the second of our Greater Cambridge Share Planning panel sessions. Um, this is on first conversation and call for sites data that we released last week. Um, we had one of these sessions yesterday, which was very busy, had 100 of people here, and hopefully we get the same today. Um, I'll run how the session's going to work. Um, for those of you who haven't been to one before, we're getting a little bit used to these now. I think this is mine and Hannah's certainly third webinar in two days, so, so hopefully we'll make it as seamless as possible. Um, essentially, we've got an hour um, in which we've got our panel here, which I'll introduce to you in a minute. Um, Hannah and John are going to run through some slides, explain exactly what we've done in terms of the release of data, what it means, um, and then there will be a couple of questions that we've already been asked. And then hopefully we should leave at least a half an hour, maybe more for questions at the end. Um, all the questions that you ask, we will answer. Those we don't get to today, we'll put on the website and put answers on there too. And if you go to the website, there will be all of the links and FAQs of questions we've already been asked. So you should be able to see them there. Um, so without further ado, I shall go around the panel and introduce them. And then we'll just do a tiny bit of housekeeping before we get onto the uh, presentation. So I'm gonna go around to my right first. Unfortunately, it's not a table, it's a screen. So I'm gonna go around to Hannah. Do you wanna introduce yourself, Hannah? Hi, everybody. My name is Hannah Loftus. I work with the Shared Planning Service, leading on communications and public engagement generally in our communities. Thank you, Hannah. Um, Caroline? Hello, I'm Caroline Hunt. I'm Strategy and Economy Manager, working on the local plan with a particular focus on strategic matters. Nadine? Morning, I'm Nadine Din. I'm the Local Plan Project Manager, working with the team to ensure the local plan gets delivered. Thanks, Nadine. And John? Uh, John Dixon, Planning Policy Manager, also working on the local plan. And we've got Stephen today as well. Yes, good afternoon everyone. I'm Stephen Kelly, I'm the Joint Director of Planning and Economic Development. Thanks Stephen. And up in the top you've got Jo Burnham, she's our tech wizard, so she's doing all the logistics for you to bring, it, um, to bring this to you seamlessly. So, so thanks Jo. Um, yeah, as I said, we've got an hour, so there will be time for questions. There's no chat function in the box down the bottom. There is a question and answer function. Um, you can put your questions in there. You can ask questions anonymously, um, or you can leave your name on there. We won't be telling, reading out anybody's names. Just to let you know, the session is being recorded, so you will be able to view it back on our YouTube channels and they will be um, on both the SCDC and the Cambridge City uh, websites and also on our Greater Cambridge Shared Planning website which we'll put a link up at the end. So without further ado I'm going to hand over, I think is it John starting first? Um, hand over to John Dixon who's going to start the presentation for you. Okay everybody here comes some slides. Um, we're running these presentations really to tell you about the uh, data we've just released, uh, give a full understanding of what it includes, and make sure people understand um, how it should be interpreted and really what happens next in a local plan making process. Um, I should stress at this stage, this is a purely a data release phase. Uh, no decisions have been taken on any issues raised in comments. Uh, no decisions have been taken uh, regarding any sites submitted. It's purely publishing at the moment what information is we've received following the consultations uh, we've already completed. Um, first of all, it's probably worth giving a quick reminder about where we are overall in our plan making process. Um, as you'll see, plan making actually takes a number of years from when you start at the very beginning on the early ideas of what the plan might be doing all the way through to uh, adoption. We started uh, back in 2019 with some initial evidence and early engagement with our key stakeholders. We had some workshops with our, our members, parish councils, for example, and really talked them through about what sort of issues our first conversation consultation might be looking at. We then carried out a pretty major consultation exercise in January, February, uh, earlier this year, when hopefully many of you uh, came across us where we got out and about around the district. We published some key questions uh, we needed some early feedback on in plan making and asked for your thoughts through various ways, which we'll come on to in a minute. Um, 
We then move on and we're at that stage where we're publishing the information we've received through that consultation. Our next step will be we're currently preparing various um, evidence bases to inform the plan, looking at those real strategic choices we've got available to us in plan making. And we hate, hope to take back some of that information to uh, our member working group um, later this year. We'll then follow that up with some further engagement, again, with our key stakeholders like parish councils and so on, resident associations uh, for the range of this year. The next key public consultation stage, however, is in summer, autumn 2021, when we go out there and say, well, having done some of that work, this is the preferred option for the plan and get full engagement feedback on that from the public, um, allowing people to comment on the proposals and the ideas the councils have come up with for the plan. That's not the end of the public consultation. There are several further stages, as you see in our diagram there, when we publish the draft plan and then the plan we propose to submit for adoption. There will be full chances to engage at that point as well. Once we've been through all, through all those consultations, we then go to uh, an examination when the plan is tested uh, by an independent inspector as well, and they eventually write the report and say whether the plan is sound and the council can adopt. So it is a long process, quite early days, but there's lots of opportunities to engage as we go through it. Uh, next slide, please. And now I'll hand over to Hannah to take you through some more details about what we consulted on and some of the information we've received through that consultation. Thanks, John. So yes, as John has just outlined, um, we had a 10 week consultation back in January and February, which was pre-COVID luckily. So we could do a lot of getting out and about and talking to people about what they'd like to see and so forth. The focus really was on the big themes that might shape the plan going forward. And we did use a lot of different methods to encourage participation. If you do look on our website, we have a summary report actually that sets out some of that information about how we got feedback and what we've learned from that and some demographic data as well, if you're interested. So now what we're publishing is everything that everybody told us during that consultation. We were asking about the big themes and where we should build and other matters. But also two of those questions were suggestions for where development should be located and also where we might look to protect or extend our green infrastructure network. It's really important, as John mentioned, to understand this is just what people have told us at this stage. It is only the raw data. There's no conclusions, assessment of whether those comments are good comments or bad comments. No conclusion of whether the sites are suitable sites or unsuitable sites. Um, but it is really in the interest of us, in, in transparency terms, us publishing for you everything that's been sent to us that we possibly can publish. There is a little bit of reduction of personal data in accordance with our privacy statements we're putting back in the public domain. As you probably will know, it's all available on our website um, and then the full submissions are in our consultation system, Opus 2 Consult, which is all publicly visible from there as well. We've also published Excel files of our data sets. So those are the call for sites, the call for green sites and also the comments received. That's again in the interest of open data and a more digital approach to planning means that you can download those, you can filter or analyse or analysis if you'd like to. There's also an interactive map which is linked through to the full records for each site. So if you find your site you're interested on the map, there's a link there that will take you through to the full site submission and likewise the other way around and PDF maps for those of you who might be more interested in something static. Just a little bit about what we got back from the first conversation and I think we're, we're really excited about the level of response we got here um, and how we can use that to help shape the strategy going forward. We had over eight and a half thousand responses um, which we're now publishing. Those range from the kind of quick comments that people could leave on our website, those could be left anonymously, we're just a sort of one click way of, of people leaving some comments and ideas for us, through to the more lengthy comments through email submissions um, and through the Opus 2 consult system for our registered users as well. And it includes over 650 development site suggestions, 21 green site suggestions and lots of comments from our events as well. 
this slide just shows you a few more of the, the kind of headline statistics about the reach here. So, you know, we're aware that some people wanted to comment, some people just wanted to find out more. And I think that's been really great as well to just have a lot more available online for people to learn, educate themselves, get up to speed with some of the key issues. Some of the things you told us uh, in terms of the big themes, climate change was the highest priority. And I think that's really great for us because really it is our highest priority too and we want to make sure that we are meeting the net zero challenge head on and, and seeing how plan can help us with that. So that was when, when we asked respondents to rank the four big themes that are the leaves on the tree in this diagram, um, climate change and lots of other things associated with that, like tree cover, like actually the design of development, how that should be more passive, more adapted to a, a heating climate and a, a wetter climate in the future, came along with that. We also asked you to rank um, wh where you would like to see new development prioritised. Um, and densification of existing built up areas was ranked top by the largest number of respondents, but we did hear a lot of very views here. Just worth saying that it is not just a numbers game here, it's whilst we take account of the really matter and the points made. So we're now in the middle of a full analysis of those comments and we'll be reporting back on how they've been taken into account, how they've been shaped, the, the, the future strategy once we get to the preferred options consultation next year. Just a little bit about the call for sites. So as many of you will know, if you've been following planning for some time, um, this is something that National Planning Guidance says we should do. They say we should hold a call for site suggestions exercise, but we also look for other sites that fit our spatial strategies. So it is not just about seeing what people send us and then picking out of that pool of sites. We also do look for other sources of housing land supply and employment land supply as well. All of these sites get very rigorously tested through a process that ends up in a not very naturally named report called the Housing and Employment Land Availability Assessment. That will be a lengthy report which will be published next year, which will go, which will go through all of the sites and test them and show you the workings out about why some may or may not be more suitable than others. It is worth knowing that on this map, obviously we have many, many more sites suggested than we actually need for development going forward. So it is a, a, there will be a lot of narrowing down that happens over the coming months. We received around 16,000 hectares worth of land suggested to us. Um, and if you add up what would be, it equates to over 220,000 homes and over 5 million meters squared of non-residential floor space. Comparing to what we might need to plan for in the next plan, we suggested in the, in the earlier consultation that we might be looking at between 5,000 and 30,000 additional homes on top of what's already in the existing plans. So that's the kind of green pie slice on this chart here as compared to the whole of the circle, which represents the quantity of sites that we were set, sent for as suggestions. So you can see that, you know, there really is no need to think just because you see these very large swathes of land on a map that we're going to be looking to adopt, you know, a, a large proportion of them into the local plan definitely won't be a large proportion. Um, there is a comparison with previous plans here as well. You know, we, we, this is not a different process from what has happened in the past. We had called for sites, we tested them and other sites suggested. Um, and the final allocations were again a very small proportion of the land that was submitted to us at those early stages and published at those early stages as well. Just on the call for green sites, again, anybody could send in land, just like with the development sites, anybody could suggest anything. Um, so we did have a really wide range of sites. If this map looks familiar, that's because somebody did actually suggest the whole of the Cambridge Green Belt as a potential site for green infrastructure. Someone else put in Cambridge Airport, someone, um, the, the Cambridge Great Park concept, which you may know about from some local stakeholders who are interested in green spaces, that was also submitted. A bit like with the call for development sites, 
These aren't the only sites we consider for expanding green infrastructure, far from it. We've had a green infrastructure evidence-based study, which is ongoing at the moment, and that has been asking many community groups as well over the summer about where green infrastructure in their areas should be protected, expanded, prioritised. So just as we do look for other sources of development land that haven't been looked for other green sites, and we consult our partners, you know, in terms of the green green networks, different green networks and the different green agencies involved with green infrastructure, we ask their views as well about that. So just to, to sum up, what does this mean? It is a normal part of plan making, which is about identifying some of our options and being transparent about that. I'm sure many of you have read that the government wants us to become more transparent and more digital in how we plan. This is really part of our efforts in also doing that um, and opening that, how that process works, allowing you to ask as many questions as you, as you want. But there is no judgment about whether any of the comments or sites have merit and you will be consulted very fully on this at the next stage. The preferred option stage, we will, as, as John's outlined, we will be showing you what we think the evidence base for the preferred strategy is and what that preferred strategy should be and then what the proposed sites that go with that might be. And at that point, we'll be asking you for all of your opinions on that. As we talked about, it is evidence led. It is about developing the right strategy and then finding the sites that fit. And when we consult, we'll be saying to you, firstly, do you think we've got the right strategy? Do you think we're right about how we've interpreted the evidence? And secondly, are they the right sites? Do you agree that those sites fit that strategy well? Do you think some of them are good and some not so good? And we're asking you to thoroughly kick the tires with us and, and tell us what you think at that point in time. John, do you want to just take over on a few more of the next steps in terms of the evidence base and so forth? Thanks. Yeah. So uh, all the sites will be thoroughly tested and we'll be looking to see if they are suitable, available and deliverable. We'll be testing them against, well, all the environmental issues you'd expect us to be looking at. So, for example, are they at flood risk? Uh, what will be their landscape impact and so on? So that evidence base will very much look at the real details around those sites before we make any uh, decision. We'll also be looking at how those sites fit in, let's say, with the overall strategy of the plan. So looking at all these issues we talked through in those big themes, in choosing the sites we put in the plan, how would how would strategy actually deliver against those themes? Uh, we will go through all the comments we received through the consultations. And indeed, one of the things we'll need to produce when we get to that, that next formal stage next year will be a, a statement of consultation showing how we've taken them into account. Um, the local plan will also be backed up by uh, a long list of evidence on a variety of topics. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are doing some initial work on those which we hope to publish to our Joint Local Plan Advisory Member Group uh, later this year, really again exploring those uh, strategic choices available to the plan. When they go to our members, they will be published online, so they will be available to view so anyone can read them. We're looking to hold some more uh, stakeholder workshops. As I mentioned, uh, we held some workshops before we moved on to the uh, first conversation consultation with our parishes and uh, with local stakeholders, you know, groups like the Environment Agency, um, National England and so on, all the groups you expect us to engage with. Um, last time round, I have to say that was um, <laughs> large rooms filled with uh, dozens and dozens of people and I suspect the challenge we're going to have in planning those events later this year is how we do it online but I think we're becoming fairly adept with working online so I'm sure we'll find a way around it and again the next big step would be uh, our full public consultation on preferred options uh, in summer autumn next year. Um, Right. Thanks very much, John. And I think we, we're going we're gonna to take some questions now. Hopefully that um, the presentation has given you a bit of clarity about what it is we're talking about um, and answer some of your questions already. I think apologies for a bit of a poor audio there. Hannah's got some audio issues. I think one of the things that we have noticed in not having um, some halls to be doing consultation workshops in is that we all need to have very, very good broadband width. So um, certainly something we should be planning for, right? 
Um, I think I'll take some questions from the beginning. We try, as I said, we try and get through them all, um, but keep them coming. There's quite a lot of you on. I tend to start with, so keep them coming. So, are you currently receiving comments on the sites that have been submitted, or does that come later? So, I'm going to hand that one over to Nadine. Um, yes, in short, we are still inviting comments. Part of the reason of publishing the information in the way that we have done is to reflect that we started the corporate sites in the early part of last year, so there's, there's been quite a lot of time since then. Uh, and we want to make sure that before we get into the real nitty gritty details of assessing these sites, we've got the most up to date information to hand. Um, and while we said we wanted, uh, a, well, we closed the consultation or the call for sites or new sites, any comments that you're able to provide now, we would welcome, but as soon as possible, please. Thanks very much, Nadine. Um, Paul, oh, can I just? Paul, can I just add, just to be clear, what we're talking about is being um, making sure that we've got um, uh, factual information from from people on those sites. This isn't a public consultation at this stage on the sites we've received. That will come further down the line once we've undertaken assessments and when we consult on the preferred option next year. Just in case that wasn't entirely clear, I thought it was perhaps worth emphasising. Thank you, Caroline. Yeah, absolutely, it's worth emphasising. This is just a bit of a data release, so we're just publishing some of our data now at the moment. Um, okay, so what is the overall development strategy that informs decision making on the suitability of the site? Is there an agreed development hierarchy? I think I'm going to come back to you for that one, Caroline. Thanks, Paul. Um, well, the short answer to that is no, there isn't an um, agreed uh, strategy at this point. So each time you prepare a new plan, you, you, you look afresh at the appropriate approach to um, planning for your development needs. And that's both the amount of development and where you, how you distribute that development. Um, so obviously we have adopted plans and that gives us a starting point to assess, but we will be looking afresh, taking account of all the factors that are important um, today as we're preparing this plan and into the future in identifying what's the most appropriate development strategy. Um, and as I said in the presentation, we're looking at a range of different strategy options um, and what would be the right um, hierarchy of development within that. So um, this time, I think it's fair to say we have a, a you know, an increased um, emphasis on particularly climate change and how we address some of these issues. Um, so we will be looking very much afresh. So no, at this point, there's not an agreed strategy at this point. Thank you, Caroline. So I'm going to take some questions that were put at the beginning. So a couple of process questions. Can we sign up to email updates on, on the local plan? And Hannah's nodding her head. I think you can sign up to email updates yeah. for everything that's happening as we're, as we're moving things through. So, so say when we sort of five minutes towards the end of this session, we will put up um, all of the channels that you can get hold of us on and then you'll be able to get into that website and sign up for those email updates there. Um, again, evidence-based studies are being commissioned for the Joint Local Plan Advisory Group meeting in October. So the evidence bases that we've commissioned have been commissioned for some time now, some longer than others, because we've asked our um, consultants to be doing quite a lot of work. Um, all of the details, again, are up. I think I'm off the top of my head, there's probably about 10, 10 studies, is there, John? I'll come over to you for that now. But I think there's more than 10. So the plan will likely be supported by a number of studies. We did publish a list, actually, it's not so convenient and available. We published a list to our members when we went to them in June. So there was a list on our cabinet agenda on our June paper. Perhaps we can include a link to that on our frequently asked questions. Um, so th there's, a, there's a list of, of studies we're commissioning. A, there'll also be topic papers. So, for example, on housing, on employment and so on, we'll put together a topic paper saying the issues we've looked at, uh, what our requirements are uh, to respond to nationally, uh, the options we've considered, and setting out really why we'll be choosing the approach we're choosing. So they'll accompany the preferred option stage uh, next year. Thanks, John. And then to pick that last question up that was related to these, is the how 
can we get more details of how the technical workshops will work? Will they include workshops per topic and who will get an invitation? I think there's a couple of questions around that. So we're kind of, as John said, we're looking at the logistics of these now. They aren't consultations. They are essentially just some workshops to you know, talk about some of the stuff that we've already just mentioned now. We will be probably running them for the same people who got invited to our stakeholder workshops I think it was at the back end of last summer, so the initial ones just before the issues and options consultation itself. As we've mentioned, the logistics are slightly changed now um, in terms of how we run these. So although there's some good stuff in what we can do online, we're going to have to think very carefully about exactly how we have these you know, will manifest themselves possibly as webinars. But we will put all the details up and we'll, we'll post them. If you do sign up for updates on the website, then I'm sure that we can arrange for that you know, for you to have updates on how to access those and you'll get invites through for those of you who will be invited to them. OK, so moving on. Okay, let's go back up to the top. Does the council anticipate housing supply can be provided in the local plan without allocating any residential greenbelt sites? So I think I'm going to come to you for that, Caroline. I think it's really an issue around, it's going to be a question around strategy. So in pure, you know, pure land take uh, considerations, clearly there's a lot of land outside the green belt within Greater Cambridge and a lot of land within the built area of Cambridge um, as, as well. Um, we will though need to look at what are the reasonable options available to us and there's a wide range of those as you saw in the presentation, everything from densifying within Cambridge, building on the edge of Cambridge, new settlements, villages along public transport corridors. So there's a range of different uh, ways we could distribute the, the, the growth that we'll need to plan for. Um, and we will have to look at this early stage on whether uh, there are any exceptional circumstances. That's the national test. It is a high bar that would have to be um, met. Um, but at this stage, we can't say that there won't be any development in the green belt. We have to go through the process of looking at the reasonable options and working out what the most appropriate strategy is. And that's a really important part of the process that we have an open mind at the beginning of, of the process uh, and work that through. We recognise the importance of green belt, though, and obviously that will play into our considerations. I think. It's just worth saying we asked a question in the first conversation specifically. In fact, there are a couple of questions about greenbelt issues in general. So those will also help inform the view that we take. So I think there's some really useful and interesting points raised there um, around the whole range of greenbelt issues, not just around climate, but biodiversity and many other things as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. And this is obviously being one of the major um, parts about the theme of our local plan as well. So kind of segueing into that, I've got a question here. It's great to see the public supporting increased tree cover. Um, can you consider setting a tree canopy cover target for areas of new development? Woodland Trust suggests an ambitious target of 30%. Now, John, I don't know whether you might be able to answer that question. So... Tree cover obviously is important not only for biodiversity, but you're providing shade in part of responding to climate change. Um, so climate change and biodiversity are both very much important issues uh, for the plan to look at. Uh, I think there are issues we'll certainly be looking at, whether they're picked up through the uh, urban design policies and whether that will be something we can pick up in a future design guide, for example, but also there is, uh, we, the plans have all, always supported um, protecting and enhancing biodiversity uh, through developments. There is a new specific requirement coming forward from government to achieve net gain through development. So it's going to be interesting to see how we can and use those proposals to uh, use tree cover as part of that response as well. So it is a really interesting one to move forward. And yes, it's an important issue to the council as well. Great, thanks very much, John. Um, so how will sites that are taken sorry let me say that again how will sites that are in the current local plan but have not yet been developed to be taken into account i'm seeing caroline is flashing here so she probably want to take this from being our current local plan expert uh well i'm not sure about that paul um but uh I think it's fair to say that, you know, your starting point be, would be that sites within your current plans 
are likely to get rolled forward into the next plan but absolutely we have to look at whether they remain um, deliverable and whether they remain suitable in the context of our any new strategy that we are, we identify in the plan so um, if there's been a change in circumstance for example uh, then we would have to look at that um, afresh and but we need to be able to be confident that a site is still deliverable so um, a number of our allocations in both the adopted plans have already got permission but where they haven't we will look carefully at them Thanks, Caroline. We're, I'm just seeing a couple of questions around the um, joint local plan advisory group. So you can find all of the details because it's a, it's a public group. You've got to find all of the details of, of the membership of that group on either of the council's web, web, websites. So it's a Freudian slip. Hannah, can you yeah. see if we can get that onto our own website so we can signpost it at least? Um, we haven't set a date for that meeting yet because we're still working through the, the, the programme of, of those kind of stakeholder workshops and what we've got to have in place for those. So that will be those. Two questions. Um, okay, a question around testing sites here. Um, this is obviously going to be our pretty much what we're going to be really focused on doing for the next few months. Um, so, when testing sites, how will legal constraints, especially natural and historical heritage, be taken into account? And I suspect all three of you wouldn't mind answering that question, but I'm going to give it to Nadine to start with, and then others can jump in if they want. Okay, so in terms of testing, it will be so the sites will be tested against the known information that we've got. And when we get to the point where we're publishing the sites and our assessments of those, we'll publish that alongside the methodology that we've used so it's all clear and transparent. Um, in terms of the specific uh, criteria, that will be set out in that methodology. Okay, Dean, is anyone else going to add into that, Caroline or John? So I think it's obviously clear to say we very much look at uh, the natural historic issues. So we will be uh, working with our conservation colleagues to look at the impact of sites on heritage assets like conservation areas, listed buildings, scheduled monuments, so on, making sure they're fully assessed. And on the uh, natural areas, biodiversity and so on, the same. We have uh, within the council um, officers who are specialists in biodiversity, and we'll be consulting those and clearly more widely as i mentioned earlier consultees in the plan include um natural england the environment agency and so on so we'll very much be engaging those stakeholders as well as the plan emerges so i think the answer is we'll thoroughly test those issues yeah absolutely another question here about the workshops so and about who will be invited to them who will be invited to the workshops how are you dealing with the highly paid lobbyists who are already contacting local stakeholders to make their case and um, i'm sure you're all aware you know being in an area like this there's lots of people with lots of interest and you know that's that's a great thing to have a lot of interest in something that we're doing and um, you know we have a statutory duty to prepare a plan and it's a you know without prejudice really so we will be inviting communities and those stakeholders to have been involved right from the beginning of that and we have to take all comments on board or news on board when we do go out to consult potentially next summer on preferred options but in the meantime we will be you know we're trying to be as open with you as possible that's why we're doing some of these workshops and trying to you know tell you what we're doing so you know we know that there's a lot of noise around but we are trying to take everything on board and be fair about how we how we how we use it okay so let's carry on um or oh, a question about getting the email updates five times over can we check our database we will indeed do that you should be so lucky to get um get them five times so that, that will, at least you won't you won't forget hannah i could just comment on that yeah apologies to people who may get them more than once it is quite fiendishly difficult to manage those databases for various GDPR and other reasons. We have to have many lists um, and we do know that some people are on them twice. We are doing our best and we are um, trying to cleanse them as much as we possibly can. So apologies. So another key issue, I mean, we had a lot, a lot of questions around this yesterday, actually. It's only the first one time I've seen a question come up about it now. Obviously, it's a, a key issue for this area um, in transport. So what role will transport planning um, play and John I'll come to you for that. Uh, well it, it's absolutely key obviously responding to climate change and so on which is one of our big themes 
also the success of the economy and simply the ability of people to move around and uh, meet their day-to-day -day needs. Um, we will be preparing a transport evidence base uh, to accompany the plan. That's going to be exploring um, the pros and cons of the different choices we have available to us, particularly looking at the impact of our options on not only the roads and the, how the impact on traffic, but one of our main aims has to be how we can support people to move uh, more sustainably. So using public transport, cycling and walking and so on. We'll need to look at how we, um, where we locate development itself so people can access jobs, service facilities locally and not need to get in their car, for example. So it's going to be absolutely key. And we're, again, we're working with other organisations like the Combined Authority, the County and so on, as they're in their highways authority and transport role as well, to make sure we're fully informed um, about their role as well. There's a lot of major infrastructure proposals in this area we'll need to consider and consider how, how, how developed they are in their processes. So for example, East-West Rail and so on, and consider how they can influence the plan. But we'll be looking at all those issues as we go forward. Caroline, do you want to add anything I've missed? Uh, no, I, I, I think <laughs> that really captures the point. You know, this, the level of confidence that the local planning authorities need to have in big new planned infrastructure is, is quite high because we, we have to show that our strategy is deliverable. And part of that is that the infrastructure in place to support a strategy um, will come forward. So um, that's obviously something that we will have to have a very close eye to as, as we go forward with some of those really big bits of infrastructure that could be quite significant in shaping um, strategies um, in this plan and, and, and beyond into the future. But we'll have to look carefully at that and the level of confidence there is as we develop the plan. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I noticed that on all the maps, Cambridge City is black and white and not annotated. What will the local plan say about the city? Hannah, I'm just going to ask you this question quickly. Oh, Sorry, the, um, so I think what the questioner means is that it doesn't look like there are many coloured um, blobs, as it were, on the map within the city itself. Um, I think there's two things to say there. Firstly, sometimes these things can be a little bit deceptive. So obviously some of the sites that people have put forward, which are outside of the city, are really, really big areas of, you know, currently farmland or, or undeveloped land. Um, and the kind of density or intensity of development you might get on those sites is much lower than the kind of development you might get or intensity of development on a, on a site in the city. There are city sites um, and we actually have an inset map so you can see in a little bit more detail, um, there's a PDF inset map that shows you that. Um, but, you know, I think there's another wider point, which is about the other sources of supply and how we look at the city more generally. It's not just about the sites that people suggest to us. It also is about the strategy. Uh, maybe John might want to talk a little bit more about how that process works. Yeah, so clearly this is a local plan that's joint and it very much will provide the planning policies, allocations and designations and so on for both areas. Um, we'll need to look at what the best strategy is for the city and as mentioned earlier it will be about whether there are other opportunities within Cambridge and not just uh, the relatively small number that have been suggested to make sure we do all things you'd expect us to do with a plan for Cambridge looking at areas that can be improved, enhanced and how we can meet those uh, housing, employment and other needs as part of Greater Cambridge. So it's not been forgotten, it's merely part of that particular mapping and the sites that we see through that process. That's great. Thank you very much, John. And I've got a question for Hannah Loftus here. So you've actually had your name put on in our in our um, in our questions and answers. So it's good that you're here to to, to um, answer this one. So the question is, Hannah, is it correct that architect Hannah Loftus, who is handling CAM's local plan engagement, worked with Fifth, Fifth Studio on the master plan? For the London Thames Gateway Development Corporation. The strategy underpinning the master plan for this was one of creating dense housing zones via linear parks and cycling infrastructure. Notably, Fifth Studio have the Cambridge Greenways contract and are working with CPPF, for those of you who don't know, that's Cambridge Past, Present and Future, and WWT, BCN and NT, I think that's National Trust and Wildlife Trusts, who as members of Natural Cambridgeshire 
have already prioritised plans for curated parks within with Cambridge ahead? Very long question. Mm -hmm. Hope you've got all of it, Hannah. Um, yeah, no, sure. To, to um, so someone, yeah, it's true that I did work with Fifth Studio a very long time ago. It was about 2004, 2005, in actual fact. I'm so old that I remember working with John Prescott on the London Thames Gateway. Can you believe it? It really is um, a long time ago when that was... Um, the strategy and yes I did work with them at the time on it was actually um, the Lee River Park strategy that we worked on and I did some engagement work with local stakeholders. Um, I think you know it's really interesting to look back over the history of some of the kind of wider plans across the country that's something that the team definitely are doing you know we are looking at, at some of the best practice and also the, the things that haven't worked out well from other parts of the country and other sites in the past, um, as well as some of the new ideas that have come forward from, from thinkers. And, and when you look at the spatial strategies work that we will we'll be publishing in due course, we'll see that we've definitely taken on board some of those ideas. But of course, we're not London. We're definitely not the Thames Gateway, which was, you know, many, many thousands of hectares of, of brownfield land, very, very different landscape there. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Hannah. It's good to have somebody famous on the, on the team. And, you know, I think one of the things where you said is, you know, having a, you know, the industry is not actually as big as all of that. So actually having and getting the best people in to do the work that we'd like to do is, is actually, you know, you tend to see the same faces about. But, um, you know, I think in terms of the um, CPPF and the Wildlife Trusts and the National Trust and Natural Cambridgeshire, you know, these are all, as we said at the beginning, they're all stakeholders. And, um, you know, they're all part of the area as well. So we are talking to all of our partners and stakeholders and residents and citizens equally. Um, so, you know, hopefully that clarifies that. Thanks, Hannah. Okay, so let's back to a few more. We've got six questions, still got 15 minutes left. So it'd be great to see some more questions coming through. Um, we have got some FAQs as well from previous sessions. So we'll go through some of those as well, maybe to jog people's thoughts. Um, I'm gonna go to a site assessment one now. So how will sites be assessed on their impact on operations, existing neighboring sites industry? So I think we've talked a little bit about how we're gonna assess the sites, but I'm gonna give that back to John just to clarify on those particular issues. That's an interesting question. So it's quite a specific one. I think if, if a site, I'm using the example, if a site was next to an industrial site, we do, one of the consultees will be working with uh, looking at sites is our environmental health team. So they will tell us if a site potentially have, has um, or would be impacted by a neighbouring use or equally if it could impact on the neighbouring use. Um, so quite a specific one, but we do again look at, look at those impacts and that interrelationship between sites and adjoining sites. Thanks, John. Anybody else want to come in on that one? Caroline, did you want to add anything on that, or are you happy with John's answer? Not happy, or not always happy with John's answers, anyway. <laughs> um, uh, yes, I mean, I think John John's answered that. Um, you know, obviously, really helpfully. Um, we absolutely take account of um, a, existing uh, uses um, in considering the suitability of. Uh, possible new sites for the local plan so that's absolutely whether they're compatible with um, e existing uses uh, or, or, or whether that suggests that they're not a suitable site for a particular use. Thanks Carol and I know there's one here that you, you probably will want to answer as well is what is the position on village development and having worked quite hard on our previous local plan for South Cams I'm sure you'd be interested in answering that one. Um, yeah, I mean, village development is always an interesting one, isn't it? Because our villages are um, really important parts of our, our, our communities. Um, and it's how you uh, ensure the villages maintain viable, vibrant, lively, support existing local services and so on. But in a way that doesn't overload those services as well and recognises that sometimes moving from our villages to jobs or services elsewhere is is difficult or in, certainly difficult by public transport um, and, and maybe requires uh, using the car and obviously thinking about climate change and sustainability generally you know we're trying to reduce use by, by the car so we will be looking in, in, in a rounded way I think as we develop the, the new local plan about what what feels the right uh, the, the right way for uh, looking at possible development 
at villages and we've asked questions about that again in the first conversation so we will be looking closely at the sort of responses that you've given us and working closely with parish councils um, as as we move forward through the process they'll be part of as one of the stakeholders in in the autumn uh, to hear what local views are um, and, and I suspect those views may vary from different villages both whether they're bigger or smaller but also where they're located and and and, and sometimes just the, the, the nature of that uh, the particular community in a particular village so um, I, I, I think we'll be looking carefully at that and I don't think we're clear at the moment precisely which way the plan will go or quite what it will say. Thanks Caroline that's really helpful. Um, how will the benefits and other ecosystem services um, stemming from the green belt be measured? Gosh, that is a very tricky question I'm not sure we can probably fully answer that but I'm gonna open it up to everybody so let's start with John because he's done a little bit of work with this already so again it comes down to the evidence base we're producing and we are producing a green infrastructure strategy to support the plan and that's really looking at what the opportunities are to enhance uh, green infrastructure and by that I mean um, ecology sites or open spaces green spaces um, and what we're looking to do is see as well as as well as you know housing employment and other services we need to enhance green infrastructure as well so in that way there may be opportunities to enhance the green belt when we're looking at site specific certainly we'll be looking at the impact of proposals on the green belt uh, in quite a lot of detail so we would hope to understand the impact if any land were to be removed what the impact on the green belt was and one of the studies we'll also be publishing is a green belt study to look at those issues uh, yeah that's great has anyone else got anything else on that <laughs> that they wanted to add in i just um i'd actually just give a little bit of a, a plug because we did talk about some of these things in the northeast cambridge area action plan webinar on biodiversity which was a couple of weeks ago and we had dan weaver who's one of our ecologists and, and the various other people from across um, actually both councils and the county talking about this so they went into a bit more detail about the measurables and that kind of thing and i do recommend you have a listen on that if you're interested in that theme yeah, I think that's right, Hannah. And, and actually, just to kind of keep with that plug, you know, so we have run around about, I think, eight sessions for the Northeast Cambridge Area Action Plan. And some of those sessions really did unpack some of the specific issues. And although they are, you know, specific to that area, we had um, housing specialists. So we had our, both our housing team. So they really got into the detail around affordable housing and tenure types. Those, all of those are available on the website. So if you really want to get into some of the detail that some of the experts we've already had on, then um, then please you know please please go to the the links that we'll put up in a, probably approximately five minutes before the end um, got a few more questions coming through let's try and get through a few more of these um, how will supplementary planning documents such as master plans be integrated into the new local plan and at what point in the process would these be considered for inclusion so Caroline I ask you to pick this one up Um, generally speaking, supplementary planning documents by definition are supplementing um, existing policies in our current plans. So for a number of the um, sites that have SPDs um, in, in place, um, they may well be coming forward already. Uh, where that's not the case, um, and for any new sites actually, we will look carefully at uh, what uh, what's the right way forward for making sure that we have the right level of policy guidance and design guidance uh, as well for bringing those forward in a in an appropriate way to make sure that they they bring all the um, supporting um, services and facilities they need to bring but also so that the design um, is, is really um, uh, thought through carefully and make sure that these places come forward in a way that is um, bringing benefits to our, our communities and, 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 and our areas moving forwards. So there may, some may get carried forward, there may be some new SPDs prepared in the full, fullness of time. 
Thanks, Carol. I mean, it might be worth mentioning, I'm, I'm sure that for those of you who have some awareness of planning, we obviously, government have um, put out a consultation for quite some quite radical changes within the planning system coming forward in a white paper, which is open for consultation until the end of October. And some of the proposals within that do, you know, do approach some quite very radical changes to plan making so you know we are currently making a plan in the old system um, and we are also commenting on that that document and our comments through the councils will be you know uh, be going through the council process by the end of october so you will be able to see them but should any of those you know in, um, proposals be put into place it will obviously need to change our thinking so we are very very closely watching um both that and the changes to the planning system um, right, let's carry on. So, is there any plan to consider developing public transport that is actually public? So much of public transport is profit driven and therefore doesn't support outlying areas and those people have to use cars. I probably think this is slightly out of the remit of planning, but I'm going to open it up to um, John, maybe have a few comments on it and anyone else if they want to, to, to feed into it. So transport is an interesting one because us as uh, the local planning authority, we're not the local transport authority. That would be the Cambridgeshire and Peter Combined Authority. Now they produce a local transport plan, which is a bit like our local plan, but for transport, obviously. And you could have a look at that on their website. And one of the things they are definitely look at and they have policies on is the uh, models and approach to public transport provision. Uh, franchising models and so on for public transport so whilst I can't get into that detail there is a lot of information out there if you go to their their website maybe that's another one a link to their site we could put in our FAQs. Thank you John. Um, let me have a look we're getting quite a few coming through right here where is when a village is already a vibrant community but fully stretched as far as amenities and services are concerned further development would destroy the what we have we came here to live as a village not an urban sprawl so Hannah I'm going to ask you now village design guide expert so yeah I mean I think it is absolutely right that we know that some of our villages had real issues during the adoption period and the examination period for the last local plan. We know that there were five year housing land supply issues and they did result in more unplanned development, um, which I can understand will contribute to some of the views that are expressed in that question absolutely. And that's why, in fact, a couple of years ago, we did start to develop some more design guidance to really give village communities a bit more of their own say and their own ability to influence and shape development better. So we absolutely don't want to destroy um, or, or create urban sprawl around villages that's inappropriate. And it is a balancing act, isn't it, between supporting the villages that have services in the right place and do in fact want those services to be sustained, whether it's shops, schools and so forth, by having a vibrant and a younger population often and not just a, an ageing population and overwhelming it. So all of those things definitely will get taken into account. Um, but, you know, we will be also asking you at the consultation stage next year about whether you think our village strategy is correct, as Caroline has mentioned. It's a really interesting one. I think we're, we're very, very understanding of how special the villages are, the, the, the character that they have, and not wanting that to become destroyed in any way. Um, whilst also accepting that some of the villages are sustainable locations for, you know, for people to live with the services and so forth of the public transport. Thanks, Hannah. I'm going to bring my colleague Stephen in now because he didn't answer the question yet and he said he's happy to pick up one about East West Rail. So can you outline the influence that East West Rail will have on the spatial and development strategy? For example, can the planning team influence the location of stations to help realise aspirations to reduce car use and encourage walking in sites and uh, transport hubs? Stephen, over to you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, uh, well, I think the East West, obviously we're, we've started an engagement process with, with East West Rail. Um, we're keen to understand what their expectations uh, and how their times table uh, links uh, to the local plan and the spatial strategy timetable. Um, at this moment in time, uh, clearly, if there are to be new railway stations, we want to make sure that they are absolutely as accessible and as linked in with existing um, cycle and walking infrastructure as well as um, 
uh, reflect um, the, the, the needs of local places. Um, the programming indicated by East West Rail does appear to be um, slightly longer than the program for the uh, local plan uh, timetable, but clearly as we both move forwards, uh, we expect to have to reflect around um, what East West Rail provides as an opportunity, um, but also uh, some of the potential um, implications and constraints from it. Thank you very much, Stephen. That's really helpful. Um, so we've got around about three or four minutes left, so we'll get through some of these these quickly. Let's do one about flood risk. We haven't talked about that yet very much. So how are you measuring flood risks, particularly the West Fields seem to be of high interest, but also imply significant flood risks? Anna. Yeah, flood is really important and that's absolutely something that every site gets assessed against during the process of developing the housing and um, uh, employment land availability assessment. I can't say those words in order, it's terrible. Healer, we call it in-house, but that's not helpful for you guys. <laughs> Um, flood risk, as we know, and with climate change is increasingly important and the Environment Agency and others are, you know, really developing this area of work in terms of how we assess it and also what we look for in terms of future proofing development for the future. So, you know, when new development comes forward, it has to prove that it is not only safe right now from flood risk but is also safe for the lifetime of that development into the future so it is actually quite a high bar that is placed with flood issues developers would need to show how they would make that safe um, and we would need to have confidence in any defenses that were coming forward being actually delivered it's not just a sort of hope value on whether or not we think defenses or other measures might come into place we need to have a high degree of confidence that they are actually going to happen Anna, thank you very much. Um, so we might even get through all of these. So I'm going to answer the question. We had a question, similar question yesterday. Apparently you answered a question yesterday around the appointment of economic consultancy SQW who worked on Cambridge Ahead SPEAR data and strategy. SPEAR, for those of you who don't know, is the Cambridge and Peterborough, Peterborough e Independent Economic Review. It's one that I can't say properly. Um, and by saying you are also using Cambridge Econometrics to assess the data, but they too work closely with Cambridge Ahead. Will there, will there a review of this data be post COVID? The whole world of office work by definition in housing suppliers changed, especially per, since SPEAR data was not peer reviewed. On what basis do you appoint consultants? Similar issues apply to consultants, Stantec appointed on the water cycle. They're working with developer urban and civic on water beach. How can this be independent? advice so a lot of things to unpack there in terms of the economic data we're aware our economic data was commissioned in a pre-covid world we understand that you know things have changed dramatically we you know even now it's impossible to say exactly what will happen and i don't think any of us could actually make a view on that we will be doing further work with with our economic data there's absolutely no doubt about that and we have to work with what we have at the moment what the available data is at the moment um, in terms of, I think this is around a conflict of interest. I think, you know, we are a public organisation, we're a public body, we go through very strict, rigorous procurement um, legislation. And, you know, in terms of plan making, we have an examination at the end of it too. So it's kind of double robust, really. And, and, and you know, we ask our, all of our consultants to provide us with any conflict of interest they might have. And so we can understand and manage that. So, uh, you know, I don't feel like that we have any issues with that at all. And, um, you know, most of the really good consultants work on you know huge numbers of projects and have to manage that on a regular basis so you know it's something that's quite you know it's quite normal within the industry and um, you know we have to have independent advice that's the bottom line that, you know it's unacceptable for us not to have that um in terms of can i just add on the on the water cycle study because we know that that's such a big issue we're also having that independently reviewed by uh, another independent academic reviewer so that's another level of check if you like on that particular study because we know that that's very very key for us to get right yeah and i suppose you know the, within within a specific industry of specialism or skill set there's only a certain number of experts and there's certainly only a certain number of experts who have some local knowledge as well. So local knowledge is also really important to us because to have understand local issues. So, you know, it, you know, those criteria are important as well. Um, cool. We're running over. I think I'll do one more question and then we will definitely get the rest of these up online. And also, please make sure that, um, you, you know, you 
put in questions to you know put in, put in go and visit the website have a look and see if there's anything there we've missed please give us your feedback um let me have a quick look just one more that's been sitting there for Maybe a we while. should address planning white paper paul because i know that's going to be an important one yeah let's just do that where is that planning reform agenda aims to grant outline planning permission from allocations how will development and management aims and strategic sites expertise be brought into the local plan? Great, okay, so I'm going to pass this to John first, probably a difficult question for him to answer. I'm sure that one of us will also be able to chip in as well. So the white paper at the moment is just a consultation, I think that's important to say, and uh, both Cambridge and South Cambridge councils will be responding to it alongside a huge amount of other bodies in the public and so on so it's i think it's important to wait and see what happens but um we will need to understand what the requirements of the the new plan would be because it would be a very different looking plan to uh, our current local plans if their proposals are taken on uh, what's in the paper at the moment um all i can say is we will clearly need to draw in that expertise we have a lot of um good knowledge and expertise in house, for example, on urban design and development management. And I think the key change would be we'd need to draw a lot of that more into the plan making side than perhaps the development management side. But I think it is still early days for us to think about that. And we'll be very interested to see what the outcome of some of that white paper consultation uh, uh, is. Yeah, absolutely, John. And it is very premature to be even thinking about that. But as I said at the beginning, we are, you know, we'll be responding to that and, you know, it may well be handy. Let us know what you think. If you'd be interested in seeing what the views of the council are, you'll be able to find them probably by the end of October once we release that information. But maybe we could even run a couple of sessions on, you know, on, on discussing some of that and its wider implications. Um, but everything that we've said today, I think we've got still got seven questions left, but we will pick them up on our website and we'll get them answered for you. You can go there. I think you'll see the slide there that Joe's put up. Um, I would say thank you so much for coming along and all of your questions. I mean, it's been great to have such a level of interest really. And, um, you know, we've had a really, really good turnout the last two days for these two sessions and some really, really good questions, some really thoughtful questions. And I hope that we've gone some way to answering some of those. Um, please also feedback on the format of how we've done this this time and we are slightly limited with physical contact now so this is the way that we are going to be trying to do things but maybe a little bit more regularly and a little bit more focused and let us know if you think that's a good format and um, I'd like to thank everybody on the panel here today who's contributed and they're getting used to being able to do this and have their faces on the screen and I wish you all a fantastic Tuesday and a brilliant rest of your week everybody. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.